Hello everyone, this is Spencer Snowling from Hydromantis and I hope you're doing well today. Thank you for joining us uh, for our regular webinar series. Uh, today we're going to be uh, taking a look at the new version of GPSX. Uh, I've titled this uh, uh, webinar here, What's New in GPSX Version 5 Part 2? Uh, partly because I uh, did a demonstration uh, last fall uh, about the new features that were coming up at that time, but we thought it would be wise to, to do that again. There's some actual new things that we didn't discuss at that time, and uh, so we wanted to demonstrate all of the new things that uh, are available in this new version of GPSX Version 6.5. Now, uh, as far as GPSX releases goes, this was actually quite a large one. There was a, a much bigger amount of new material than usual uh, in our release this year. So my name is Spencer Snowling. I'm VP of uh, Product Development here at Hydromantis, and I'm glad that you could join us today. So my plan is, uh, as usual with these webinars, is to uh, highlight some features. So today we're going to take a very, uh, a very quick tour through a lot of different things. Uh, and I usually try to give you some slides and some background material on what that's all about, and then I'll be running a number of desktop simulations to sort of highlight uh, those features. So uh, I'll be doing a lot of hopping back and forth between my slides and our software today. So I'll just mention briefly before we get started that uh, and, uh, for those people who are using GPSX right now, if you have a, a yearly subscription uh, for your particular license or you have a yearly tech support contract in place, you should have already received uh, the link and the new key codes for downloading and, and installing the new version of GPSX. Um, if you believe that you should have received that and you have not yet received it, please contact us uh, and let us know. Or if you're unsure whether your license receives automatic updates or not, um, you can always send us an email at support at hydromantis.com uh, to find that out. So we'll be glad to help you out with that. Okay, so I've decided to try and break this up into a number of new software interface features first, and then I'll get into some new uh, wastewater models uh, afterwards. So I'm going to start with uh, a feature that uh, we put into version 6.4 and we've expanded upon this uh, version right now. And that's taking a look at the way that we display information about the operating costs of running your wastewater treatment plant. So you may know that for oh, many releases now, uh, at least 10 years, we've had operating cost models in GPSX. And they focused around uh, integrating and calculating and doing all of the uh, bookkeeping on uh, the costs for aeration, the cost for pumping, so for your RAS and your lift stations and influent pumping stations and all of that sort of thing, uh, putting those together and also then looking at chemical costs and sludge disposal costs and so on. Uh, you always were able to get a hold of that information uh, by looking at the output variables menu of any particular unit process object um, and then going to the operating cost menu. So uh, we had one in each object and then we have one that kind of sums things up for the whole plan. So what we've done is we've now taken this information and also plotted it in other ways that are a little easier to sort of take in and get your head around. Um, and that is by using our uh, two new buttons that we have up along the top, uh, just above where you plot all of your graphs and put all of your tables. Um, we had this new Sankey diagram here that's calculating the mass flows of things like COD and nitrogen and phosphorus around the plant. So just to the right of that, there's a new button here that summarizes energy usage throughout the plant and another new button uh, that summarizes the operating costs. And so let's take a look at that energy usage button first. So if you run a simulation, uh, then that's complete and you have some, some answers for your simulation. You can then hit that button and this particular graph will come up. It takes the layout that you've drawn and and it uh, lays on top of that um, the numbers that are actually the power usage uh, for each one of the individual units. And it uh, shows that information here and it does some coloring that allows you to sort of see how those things fit, uh, um, uh, you know, compare to one another. And it sort of highlights very easily which are the major units in your plant that are that are uh, using that inf uh, using that energy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, actually run some simulations here. This is an example that comes from our uh, sample layouts menu. Uh, just I'll quickly show you how to find that. If I go down here to software features and I go to this uh, energy and costing uh, diagram example, um, this is a, a very simple, straightforward activated sludge plant, although it's doing uh, nitrification and, and denitrification. Whoops, sorry, I selected the wrong one there.
software yes. do, do, do. energy costing diagram example yeah. there we go <clears throat> so this plant is actually uh, uh, an MLE process there's two parallel trains there's uh, uh, the, the fair dosing units here for doing the phosphorus removal and then we have a thickener and we have some uh, hauling uh, uh, for to haul the sludge away and I've put down one of our uh, building uh, units as well. This is another thing that uses some energy as you would typically at a plant and uh, this is also be included in all of our overall plant calculations for energy usage and you can put as many of these down as you need in your plant too. Okay so let's actually run a simulation here. <clears throat> So I'm just going to run uh, the default scenario. And then uh, this is basically the, the standard calculations that come out of any time that you run uh, a GPSX simulation. All of these operating cost models are in there and built and solved for you all the time. Okay, so that's solved now for steady state. And I'm going to click on the energy usage summary first. And here's our diagram that shows us uh, the energy usage. And we, we break that down into different kinds here. So these are two anoxic tanks followed by an aerated tank here. And so therefore, obviously, the aeration power is limited to just the aerated side. If I click on pumping, we can see here there's quite a lot of pumping going on in the, uh, in the influent lift station, for example. Uh, there's a big pumping associated with the secondary clarifiers because, of course, that's driving the RAS that goes back to the to the head of that uh, aeration basin and of course our internal mixed liquor recycle is also listed here as well. So I can take a look at uh, mixing power, obviously places where we have completely mixed tanks and other things, other uh, sorted out uh, things like moving the rakes and so on. Uh, you can actually look at the total power uh, for the whole plant as well and if I click uh, uh, in the background it'll take me over to this other view which allows me to sort of uh, see this in a pie chart summary. I can look at this table, I can see all of those details, and this is showing me the overall for the entire layout, um, where we can see here that that uh, aeration and pumping power makes up a majority of the, uh, of the use of power at this particular plant. Okay, so that's, that's just the energy part. Now we're going to take the same approach again with the overall operating cost. So energy is only part of the uh, picture, of course, right? So now instead of looking at kilowatts up here, we're looking at uh, dollars per day. And so it's uh, some of those energy costs are still broken out here, but now we're also including the things like the chemical dosage cost and the sludge disposal cost. And so those things are highlighted separately. And again, it's the same kind of format. You can uh, click in the background to come to this pie chart area and you can investigate what's going on in any one particular unit. So for example, here in our completely mixed aerated reactor, we have a large aeration cost, uh, some uh, other miscellaneous cost, uh, and then there's the cost associated with the pumping that was taking back that internal mixed liquor recycle. So these are nice tools that allow you to visualize uh, uh, very nicely uh, the use of energy and the, and the general amount of uh, cost that it takes to run that plant. And this is all new features in version 6.5. Okay, back to the slides. One thing I'll very quickly mention that is associated with this calculation is the fact that we have a new energy pricing model. So when it comes down to doing the calculation, we figure out how much uh, energy is being used at any one time when we know the flow rate and we know the head loss and all the other things that are required, pump efficiencies and so on. Um, but then we have to multiply by a price per kilowatt hour. And uh, we used to have a model that was either constant or allowed it to change during the day. And we've now extended that so that you can have it so that it exchanges, uh, pardon me, it, it sets up a new uh, uh, energy price at uh, different times of the week. So if you have a place where the, the price is cheaper on the weekend, you can take that into account in your model. And also seasonal pricing. We have different prices for summer and winter and so on, and summer weekends and some winter weekends. It's quite a bit of fidelity there to allow you to hopefully hit um, you know, any combination of different um, elements for the energy costing in your wastewater treatment plant. Okay, I will also mention uh, that we have uh, changed the methodology for setting up the optimizer in GPSX. So it used to be sort of a multi-step process to identify the variables that you're trying to optimize and the targets and setting up the data that you want to be able to fit to. So uh, we have now replaced that with uh, this methodology here, which pops up this window for optimizer setup. You can uh, go through a step-by-step -step process by clicking uh, back and forward and uh, you know go to, go to the next step here. It allows 
allows you to select the variables from this menu right inside this window rather than opening up the windows in, in the GPSX layout. Um, we also have uh, various options now too that have been set up before you kind of had to know how to set this up on your own. Now we can specifically say I want to minimize something. So I want to minimize total nitrogen in my effluent or I want to maximize some sort of efficiency or what have you. So a lot of those things are there. You can automatically add your data file and then it rebuilds with all of the various changes that are required that used to have to be manual steps that you did. So I'm not going to go through all that process now because I want to get on to our new wastewater models. So there are quite a few new objects in GPSX. I believe there's six or seven new ones in this release of the software. So um, the one that uh, we've been working on probably the longest um, is the membrane aerated bioreactor model. So this is for units. This is a biofilm model, so you'll find it in the attached growth group. And it's for systems where you have biofilm that grows on a hollow fiber membrane. So uh, on the surface of the membrane, you are diffusing air into the biofilm from the inside. And then, of course, the bulk liquid surrounds the biofilm on the outside. So um, this is a, a unit that... Um, uh, allows some efficiencies and some uniqueness to it um, to be able to do nitrification and denitrification uh, by providing the oxygen from the inside, from one side, and then the substrate and ammonia from the other side. So we've been working on this model for some time, and we've successfully calibrated it to the new GE Z-Lung system. And uh, so I will show you a few of the parameters. Uh, many of them you'll recognize from our other biofilm models. Um, those being that you need to know things about the surface uh, of that media in terms of the diameter of the of the membrane and so on and uh, how much how many cassettes you're using and so on so that we can calculate the actual total amount of surface media surface area that's available there to grow the biofilm on. You also uh, are using many of the same approaches for attachment and detachment. There's some slight changes, and this, this model is slightly different than some of the other biofilm models we have, but the general concept is the same. There's five biofilm layers, and we are um, growing the, biofil the biomass in those biofilm layers, and we are diffusing the soluble components from the bulk liquid into that biofilm. So it is that balance between growth and diffusion and so on. And um, you, the really excellent part of this model, as it is in all of our biofilm models, is that you can plot the concentrations inside the biofilm to see really what's going on in, in any particular system. So, for example, um, I'm showing you here the dissolved oxygen for uh, uh, this particular layout. And we can see that uh, there's a gradient of oxygen. So what you're looking at here is um, as we go from left to right, that's going downstream in a series of reactors. And in the uh, front here, uh, these are the, li the bulk liquid in the front, then the first biofilm layers, and then at the back is where the media is. So this makes sense here. The dissolved oxygen where is highest where it's diffusing through the, uh, through the membrane surface area at the back. So, uh, consequently, we can see here, if I look at the AOBs, the, uh, the nitrifiers, they grow where the oxygen is at that inside there. So, we can see that, um, that there's a distribution of biofilm, uh, biomass within the biofilm. Okay, I'll run a very quick demonstration of what that looks like here. Um, again, if you go to our sample layouts menu, you can find this to uh, play around with uh, on your own. So, here's membrane aerated bioreactor. That's in our unit process examples here. So this particular um, uh, setup is done in a IFAS uh, configuration. So uh, there is a recycle of the mixed liquor uh, coming back into that MABR unit. And I'm going to uh, flip over to this uh, biofilm profiles uh, section. And again, uh, I'll just quickly highlight that um, uh, the, the liquid is in the front and the biofilm surface area, the, the media surface area is in the back, and we have our, and we have our, our biofilm layers. So uh, the, the ammonia that's coming into this system here on the influent side, um, it's highest out in the liquid, but we can see as it diffuses into uh, the biofilm going towards the back here, it's being, uh, it's being oxidized by the nitrifiers that are there. So we can take a look, detailed look at how that uh, works. We can see the nitrite in, in this particular system that's being generated as well, and we can see the nitrate and so on. And that's all, of course, the part of that balance and why it's useful to have a model of this particular system. We can see here, interestingly, that the, the heterotrophs tend to want to grow on the outside, 
and the autotrophs want to grow on the inside. So that there offers some uh, process advantages from doing it that way around. Okay, so we're going to hopefully do a, uh, an entire webinar just on this particular model at some point down the road, which I would like to be able to do. Okay, so back to the slides again. <clears throat> Another unit process that uh, has been added to GPSX in, in, the, in the solids handling line is the hydrocyclone model. This is very useful for situations where you're doing side stream nitrogen removal and you want to be able to incorporate uh, some solid separation into that anamox system where you want to be able to preserve those valuable slow growing anamox biomass and uh, that's often done with uh, the with a, this type of a hydrocyclone unit, which is a vortex that uses the, separates out the heavier uh, materials in that waste stream. And uh, the Hanamox biomass preferentially uh, separates out in these types of units, and then that can be recycled back around. So in that particular unit, you'll find uh, that, that we have a solid separation model, a relatively simple one, but it is on a state variable by state variable basis. So you can specify for each type of COD that's present uh, in your system, uh, each type of particulate material, what that solid separation unit is. And then we have calibrated this one so that it works well for that side stream process. So very quickly, I will show you again what that looks like. And we have uh, in our sample layouts menu uh, under uh, the unit process examples, no, I'm sorry, it's under the side stream processes. Under the side stream here, side stream deammonification, the Animox process, you can open up that layout where we already have a, a nice layout put together that incorporates that hydrocyclone there. Um, just let me uh, zip back here so we can see this more clearly. Um, in this particular case, after digestion, uh, we can see we'll have a very large ammonia and phosphorus load coming down this way. We can then pass it through a nitritation tank, which allows... Uh, you know, to convert some of that ammonia to nitrate, and then an anamox tank uh, to be able to take the combination of ammonia and nitrate together and convert that to nitrogen gas. That's what this side stream deammonification process uh, is all about. And so to do that, we want to preserve that anamox, keep that biomass there, and so we're going to use this hydrocyclone to recycle that back. So let's quickly run that uh, uh, just so that you can see what the results look like. And what I'm going to do is just let this settle out to the steady state answer. And then we'll take we'll start out by taking a look at the nitritation reactor here. So this has an ammonia load coming in here from that centrate of uh, 349 milligrams per liter of ammonia. And we can see by the time it leaves here, that ammonia, uh, but, and there was no nitrite or nitrate, has been at least partially oxidized to nitrite. So we have now roughly half here. Uh, uh, split between the ammonia and the nitrate. So when we move on to that anamox reactor, uh, we can now see that uh, by the time it leaves the anamox reactor, the ammonia has been uh, completely removed here as well as most of that uh, nitrate as well. So um, we can even plot by looking at the output variables menu here, uh, the actual concentration of the various types of biomass. And if I come in here, I can see that we have uh, a large concentration of ammonia uh, pardon me, Animox biomass growing in this particular side stream system. Okay. Hey, moving on. I will mention also that we have uh, changed up the way that we uh, use our controllers in GPSX. Previously, things like the on-off controller and the timer controller and so on were found in the toolbox object. So starting with this uh, particular with this release in version 6.5, we have added over the years quite a bit of stuff to the toolbox object, and so it was time to sort of clean that up and move the controllers out to their own objects and keep everything else in that toolbox object. So you'll find a new process control tab actually here uh, in, in GPSX. Um, now you'll find these process controllers that you can drag and add to your screen. And all of the ones that you have been using in the past, like the PID, the on-off timer and scheduler and so on, these are all available for you to use. And if you have an old layout that is version 6.4 or earlier, and you bring that into version 6.5, it will automatically move all of that material over there for you. Okay, so um, 
I will very quickly give you a demonstration here. I'd also like to point out that um, uh, the last webinar that we did in December actually makes use of these various um, uh, types of controllers when we talked about doing uh, cascade ammonia control. Um, and so I used combinations of PID and on-off type controllers. Uh, those were available. If you want to go back and take a look at that webinar on our YouTube channel, you can see those uh, controllers in action. But I'm going to show you a different one uh, actually right now, which is a place where we just have um, uh, a very simple setup with an, a conventional activated sludge uh, system here, and we are taking away our waste activated sludge and storing it in this storage tank. And we're using a level controller to every so often when it fills up to a certain level, um, we will let it uh, de we will sort of drain that tank by using this controller. So basically there's n there's this pump down here is not doing anything at all when we first um, uh, run the system. And uh, so that system is filled up and now we can pump it down down to this lower level, which we can specify as part of the model. And then now it's not pumping it at all in, at the moment. And then as soon as it hits that upper level, it drains it again. So it's a way of setting up a, a intermittent controller system where you specify the upper and lower tank volumes. And then it will, of course, activate the pump and do its job when it's supposed to do it. So, and uh, that's just a one uh, a typical example of using a timer controller, or pardon me, a on-off uh, type controller. All right, back to the slides one more time. Another interesting model that we've been working on again for some time, and we're happy to uh, finally have it released in the software, is our chlorination model. This was part of a project that we have done over the past couple of years with one of our clients. Um, we have a new chlorination model that exists in the existing chlorination object. I don't know if you've ever used it very much before. We had a, a simple uh, UV model that was in there before and a simple model for doing uh, just the disinfection side. Uh, but now uh, this new model actually does uh, model uh, the, the formation of chlorination byproducts and disinfection, disinfection byproducts that you would get from adding chlorine to a system where there's some ammonia present. So um, this is uh, something that's been developed over a period of time and we've calibrated it uh, quite well. Um, we are going to do a webinar just on this particular part of the model, uh, actually in about a month's time. I'll mention that when we get to the end of today's webinar. So, But just very briefly, I mentioned this is the behavior that we are trying to capture. Um, when you're looking at the amount of chlorine that you're dosing into a particular system, um, there, the behavior and the way that it forms these products or doesn't form these products is, is basically related to the amount of um, ammonia and chlorine in their relative amounts. So in systems where you have you know, up to five times as much chlorine as ammonia, produce a monochloramine and it uses up some of the chlorine in the presence of a small amount of ammonia. And when you get up to that ratio of about five to one, uh, we move on to this uh, second zone here where suddenly it's able to form uh, dichloroamine and trichloroamine and it's using up the, uh, the, the, um, the ammonia in a, in a much greater rate. And you can see here that uh, those formations of those byproducts, it's sort of actually oxidizing it all the way to nitrogen gas. But at some point it's going to use up all of that uh, nitrogen, all of that ammonia that is available. And then you'll be moving on to, if you still increase and add more uh, chlorine, you'll get to the point where you're just having free chlorine residual. And this is the point at which you can have actually a significant formation of other things in the model, such as trihalomethane. And, uh, uh, and so I'm going to show you a demonstration of how that actually works in the model right now. And once again, this is one of the things that you can find in your uh, sample layouts menu here. Um, in this particular case, I believe this is also in the unit processes here when we go down to chlorination and disinfection here. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I've actually got this set up using our analyzer feature, doing a sensitivity analysis. And what we're going to do is uh, run a quick sensitivity analyzer function here, and that is going to run a number of steady state simulations as we increase the chlorine dosage. So that's, the, that's sort of in the same way trying to reproduce that graph that I was uh, just previously showing you. It is there to sort of uh, increase that ratio of chlorine to ammonia. 
Okay, and so we can see here, this is a, uh, you know, it's roughly approximating that particular set of zones here, the point at which we're having an increasing dosage, which is the line in red. We can see that the chlorine residual that is available also increases until we get to that sort of 5, 5.5 ratio that I mentioned, at which case we can then form those other sort of uh, higher ratio uh, compounds. And then that's consuming up that ammonia, ammonia is here in black. Uh, until it's uh, got down to a, a part that cannot really be removed anymore, and then that free chlorine residual is starting to be produced again. And as I mentioned, we also uh, 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 calculate the formation of uh, trihalomethanes, and um, uh, part of this model is there to sort of indicate that in the presence of those other amines, they're not... Um, uh, you know, the formation of this trihalomethane doesn't happen as readily, but it does really uh, kick in when you got to the point here where there's only the free chlorine residual left. So that aspect here is shown by the way that this increases after we get to that, uh, that sort of break point. Okay, so back to the slides. Almost to the end now. I'll mention that we have a new plug flow tank with aeration header object as well. That's found in the suspended growth processes. It looks very much like our regular plug flow tank. Um, however, you'll notice that it has the aeration header shown on the uh, back of the object here. Now, as far as the biological aspects of the model go, it, it basically is exactly the same as the regular plug flow tank. And in fact, in terms of the oxygen transfer calculations, it's the same as well. But uh, what we do is we ask you for a lot of details in this model to describe the header itself. So um, you can see some of these parameters here in terms of um, the, the diameters of the header pipe and the drop pipes and so on, and, and a lot of the losses, and a lot of details about the valves as well in terms of the way that they're controlled and the way that they operate and their valve positions relative to the amount of flow and so on. And what this allows you to do is, is basically supplement the existing model that we do in terms of oxygen transfer and airflow with now being able to model the header pressure and the head loss and the valve positions under the different control types. So for my last uh, demonstration here, I will very quickly move back to uh, looking at um, one last uh, sample layout here as well. So this one is actually under a process analysis example here, this uh, aeration header and most open valve example. And again, it's a conventional activated sludge tank. And so we're going to run actually a short dynamic simulation at uh, this time with a varying influent flow so that we have um, a bit of uh, change in the loading so that we can see how the, the aeration system responds to that. So as the flow goes up and down, the loading goes up and down to that plant, we can see here that uh, in black the, uh, the pressure at the, the, the header outlet here is showing that it's um, increasing, of course, as the demand, as we had a higher load coming into that plant, as the demand increases, the lower pressure has to increase as well to supply more air. Now, what I'm using here is actually the most open valve concept for controlling that, and you can even uh, take a look at the valve positions here themselves. So uh, starting from the left here, one, two, three, four, in terms of those four tanks in series, um, this is number one in black. Number two is actually the one that is the most open valve. And we can see that it stays open the whole time. And uh, it, it's the one that's sort of controlling the system. The other ones adjust their pressures accordingly to maintain that one open valve and then supply the appropriate air that's being uh, demanded from the system. We can actually switch over to um, other systems. In fact, I've got a, a pressure set point example put together here as well. And you'll notice that in this particular case, the uh, philosophy is now different. It's not trying to maintain one particular open valve um, at a lower pressure. This is saying just open up the valves as much as required to do the job and maintain an existing blower pressure set point, which I'm showing here. So we can see instead of going up and down and responding to the, to the system, uh, you know, it's just got a set point that it meets and the valve positions all went accordingly. And, you, and you'll notice here that none of them are completely open all the way. So uh, that's the, the variation on that uh, type of uh, concept. So this is a new feature that you can take advantage of when you're uh, doing your modeling in GPSX, uh, if you like, if you feel that's important to your particular project. Okay, <clears throat> so 
leave. We're at the end. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I almost forgot our new water quality index calculation as well. We were doing a project where we wanted to have a sort of an overall measurement of the quality of the, uh, of the effluent. And so we added this new little feature to the receiving water object, which is also known as the one where the pipe empties into the river with the fish. If you ever blown that up, you can see the fish quite clearly. And in that case, you set for the uh, effluent quality a number of particular targets that are required for the appropriate um, treatment in this, in this receiving water. And then you set some weighting functions, and there's some default values that have been in, in, entered in here for you. And then there's some, uh, an approach that was taken in the cost simulation benchmark report that gave an overall measurement, a single number that you will come up with to um, uh, you know, a measure or give you sort of an overall index value of the, of, of the quality of the system. So the lower the index, the better the quality. And you can either do it as an overall number or you can use it as a difference between the target and, what, um, uh, the, and, the, and the actual concentration that comes out of the plant. Okay, so I'll mention uh, lastly here that there are, of course, a large other number of other things that we've done as well. We've made some improvements to our Sankey mass flow diagram. You can actually uh, inactivate the part around the mixed liquor so that that doesn't always have to be the largest uh, thickness line on your, on your diagram. We uh, have a new oxi advanced oxidation process unit that's there to help break down that COD. Uh, we made, as we always do with every release of GPSX, a number of updates to the Mantis II biological parameters, the growth rates and half saturation coefficients and so on. Um, we always make some small uh, tweaks and updates based on our experience using the model and our own projects. We made a couple of changes to the way that the uh, biofilm detachment model works. This is some new information that we, were, we learned when we went through uh, the development of a couple models as parts of projects that we've done during the past year. We've added mixing energy into the model, and that is included by default in all objects now. We made some updates to our solver settings to help kind of make things flow a little more smoothly. And uh, we've added more sample layouts. Many of them I've shown you here today and sorted bug fixes as always.